This video was recorded in front of a live virtual audience. Hi everybody, Jacob here. Welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to be reviewing Paris Edinburgh from Chanel, from the Les Zoo de Chanel collection. Hold on, let me just up the mic a little. Okay. Uh, I have gotten this recently and um, let's see what it's all about. If you haven't already but like my content, then consider subscribing to my channel here on YouTube. You can also push the join button next to the subscription button, become a member today, gain access to extra perks. Uh, you can follow me, uh, well, depending on where you see this video actually, I have a perfume dedicated channel called Essentially Jacob. Essence minus T-I-A-L-L-Y, Jacob, dedicated to perfumes. I'm in the phase right now of getting people to know the perfume channel. So you might see this video on my main channel or on the perfume channel because, you know, I'm in the process of moving the perfume videos over to the other channel. But so for now, there's a little bit of a transitional phase. Sorry for the confusion, but as all good moves from one house to the next, it always takes some time. So thank you for subscribing to both my channels, Essentially Jacob and Super Jacob. This video is being filmed live in front of a virtual audience. So thank you guys so much. My co-reviewers are in the chats right here. Let me just set the chat a bit closer to me. Okay. And uh, you can also partake in my live streams where I pre-record these videos um, on my main channel every Saturday. So just go to my home or community tab right around Friday and then you get to see me post you get to see the post announcing the live stream on a Saturday, and then you get to see your local streaming time, so you can set a reminder. Okay, so let's get straight to it. Paris Edinburgh has been released in 2021. Although it was planned for a release in the summer of 2020. It was then postponed, although some boutiques did receive a couple of bottles by mistake in 2020. So a few lucky people got this perfume a year ago. And then they were all taken back again, sent back to headquarters and postponed for a whole year. And then they were launched. Uh, then the perfume was released this year. Perfume being released this year, as we're filming this video in 2021, in particular, June, May, June. I want to say June because June is the month of my birthday. So I'm kind of happy that Chanel releases a perfume during my birthday. Thank you so much, Chanel. So there's that element of the lockdown for lack of a better word, because we can't really say the other word here. It's a, that kind of locked down the world. And for an entire year, Chanel postpones the release of a fragrance, half a year postponing the release of Le Lion de Chanel as well. But this one got a full year pushback. That never happened before in history. So it's kind of, from a historical point of view, it's important to say this. Planned 2020, but released in 2021. So you can see how this how the, the the sprayer it's very airy misty. So already from the spray, you see how generously I'm just applying it. It it's supposed to be a cologne, but it has the designation of an eau de toilette. And it is very airy, misty. The sprayer doesn't just spit on you. It's it's literally it sprays out a very fine mist. So in fact, a lot of it gets dispersed in the air. You can't really localize the spray unless you puddle spray, spray it really very, very close, which is also not the idea of this fragrance. You're supposed to kind of actually just spray the mist all over, just walk through it several times. Um, but always consider the fact that it does state that it's an eau de toilette, but it's an eau de cologne in reality. In fact, the Le Zoo range, when it was first conceived, it was supposed to be launched as an Eau de Cologne range, but then Chanel changed their mind last minute and renamed them Eau de Toilette Concentration so they could charge more. Speaking of price, not very happy with the fact that they've upped their price considerably. Um, when they first came out, the price was 112 euro, I want to say. Yeah for 125 mil. So it was less than a euro per milliliter. Now it's around 128. So it jumped from 112 to 128 for 125 mil. That means that you're paying more than one euro per milliliter. That's a lot. Especially considering that other fragrances 
like the historic Pour Monsieur by Chanel, costs less. This one has been upped in price as well. So this one is around 99, almost 100 euro, but it's 100 mil. So this is one, it's less than a euro per mil. This one, this range has now reached a point where it costs more than a mil, uh, more than one euro per mil, which means that they're classified by Chanel now higher, even though the concentration is lower. So I'm not a big fan of that. But it's important in this review to also state it. The price has gone up. Okay, now let's get to the nose. So Olivier Polge is the nose behind all Le Zoo fragrances that have been released thus far. And I will post the link to the review of each and every one of them because I have reviewed all of them in the comment section down below, but sprinkled throughout this video also in the card section up above. So be sure to keep looking up here from time to time uh, for the links to the other Lezu reviews, uh, cards. Be sure to look for the cards with the links to the other Lezu reviews. Paris Venice, Paris Biarritz, Paris Deauville, and Paris Riviera. Okay, so I have written down my little notes here. So, Olivier Polge is the name. Top notes is the game. Top notes, we got juniper, berries, and cypress. Mid notes, cedar, vetiver, lavender. Base notes, musk, and vanilla. Now, that's what they list. However, there's more to this fragrance than that, in my opinion. I, through testing it out, I also have discovered a minty tone to it. There's like a mint like a vetiver mint going on there. There's definitely aldehydes. It's very sparkly in the opening notes, even though the vanilla subdues it already and gives it a, a clearer note, um, a sweeter note. So I also smell citrus, licorice, and then there's um, a camphorous smell, like a eucalyptus meets camphor, reminiscent of tiger balm type of smell in the in the base as well it has bergamot i feel a similar bergamot that they use in uh pour monsieur and i also sense um like a like a smoky resinousy there's some smoke in there, very delicate. All of these are just hinted at, okay? They're not massive. Don't think like, if you're a, if you're a lover of any one of these notes that I'm listing now, don't think that you're gonna love this perfume. This perfume has all of these nuances in it, but they're all very delicate. None of them like screams out at you, you know? Mm. Yeah, there's this smoky resinousy note that could also be licorice -y. And it's an interesting smell. Um, however, you know, I have received it now, purchased it now in summer. I do not know how this one is going to perform in winter. It does work for summer, though. And here's something fascinating. Okay, a couple of points, and I've written a lot of notes on that, like pages. So before we get to it, though, let me show you a little something that I got at the Beauty Boutique. So when I purchased the uh, Paris Edinburgh uh, fragrance, okay, I got this little fan. Which looks like this. It's just a paper fan that you have to unfold yourself and it does say Paris Edinburgh on, on it. So it's a kind of a little plissé going on there. It's white on the other side, so. I can fan myself as I talk. Pra practical, very practical. Thank you for that, Chanel. Very much appreciated. So, um, listen. One thing to note first. Chanel, I have noticed a pattern. Once I smelled Paris Edinburgh, I realized it, it dawned on me out of the blue i was like oh 
finally, kind of, sort of, the last piece of the puzzle, in terms of what, I, what was already brewing in my mind, falls into place. What does that mean? Well, basically, I realize now the pattern forming here. What I have come to call the Chanel Trinity. It ain't a divine trinity. It's just a trinity, but a trinity nevertheless. That trinity being Olivier Polge on one side of this triangle, on the other point of the triangle, Virginie Via as the artistic director of Chanel. And the third is Lucia Pica, the artistic director of makeup. These three little mongrels together are definitely defining the new chapter of Chanel style and heritage. These three together are delivering a brand new type of Chanel. And this perfume made it clear to me. This perfume is very, very, very indicative. It just made everything fall into place. It made everything align. It made Virginie Viard's vision for Chanel align with the perfumes, with the makeup, everything was slightly off to me since Carl died and all of these new introductions of all of these new artistic directions that they were taking. Everything was off. But now I feel like, okay, it's, it's, it's getting its body. It's becoming a full body that I'm starting to understand. And this is a new chapter for Chanel. This is a new time for Chanel. Um, this perfume does not smell like a classic Chanel perfume. OK. And yet. And I've said this and I watched back my old videos when the first Le Zou fragrances were released with Deauville and Biarritz and Venice. I already mentioned back then that. This is how the new Chanel smells. And if you have watched my Chanel number no. 22 Eau de Parfum review, which I just posted a short while ago, you would have noticed something that I said there. I kind of dropped an Easter egg. Um, and I mentioned something about Olivier Polge rounding the edges. If we go to older Chanel perfumes from the time of mm, Ernest Beau delivered sparkling aldehydes, but it was Henri Robert who delivered a cold edge to Chanel fragrances austere, aseptic, while Coco was still alive. That was a whole other era of Chanel. Now, fast forward to the 2000s, to the 10s, uh, with Olivier Polge taking over his father's job. And what do we see? So we have, for example, the bottle of the Les Exclusives fragrances. Okay, I have an example here. Cuir de Roussy Eau de Toilette, 200 ml. Look at all these corners. They're a little bit rounded on the sides, right? But they're kind of cornery and edgy and stompy in a way. You know, this is Chanel. It kind of bumps into you and hurts you on the sides. It's the bottle reflects the philosophy of the perfumes that are inside of it. Very much so with Chanel. Same to Pour Monsieur. The fact that it's a little bit more elongated also describes more, it always fits, the, the smell matches the bottle. Now, I said that Olivier Polge started rounding the edges. His vision of perfumes is softening them, rounding them, making them less aggressive, making them less austere, making them less arrogant, like a lot of old school Chanel perfumes can be. And in fact, the first range of perfumes that Olivier Polge gets to make at Chanel is the Le Zou range. That's the first range that's his own. His dad had the Les Exclusives, and Olivier is adding on top of those. But a range that he got to do from scratch was Les Eaux. And what a coincidence that Les Eaux, all the edges are rounded. Look at that. We have no corners. It's, it's completely rounded. The bottle reflects the perfumes inside of it. And if we observe the Les Eaux range in its entirety for the smells that they deliver, not one of them has edge. They're soft, rounded, caressing, easy, 
breezy, pleasy, peasy. You might like it, you might not like it, but it is what it is. The only one that is maybe a little bit more edgy and crystalline in its, it's the citrusy lily of the valley in Paris Biarritz. But all the other ones are very, very almost sandalwoody. Now there's no sandalwood listed in here, but there's cedar. And cedar is, is it's very intense in this one. So it's a soft blow to this world of Chanel, Virginie in terms of smell. Virginie Via delivers a soft blow in terms of fashion for Chanel. Her clothes are much more user-friendly than Carl's were. She's less, her clothes, for women, her clothes are more comfortable than Carl's were. Carl was about staging theatrical pieces in many cases. She's all about comfort, which Coco was. So we're going back to the roots. Coco, when she was younger, was also softer when it came to smell. So this is kind of the youthfulness of the return to old school Chanel. But when Coco Chanel was in her 20s, if she had the power when she was in her 20s back then, her perfumes would have been like this. They would have been softer. Just like, you know, her jersey outfits were softer. Everything was more rounded and soft. In the new era of Chanel, in the 20s, because we are in the 20s, it's like literally being back in the 1920s, hopefully not politically, but at least stylistically. Virginie, De Virginie Via is delivering the comfort of 20s Chanel, which is not over the top exuberant. You yeah, guys, she ain't good. She Thank God for that, that she ain't Alessandro Michele and all that crap. Let that stay where it should. In the tacky drawer, we're back to simplicity and beautiful elegance and comfort. Same applies to perfumes. Olivier's perfumes for Chanel are comfortable, elegant, and soft. Virginie Viard's collections are comfortable, elegant, and soft. Lucia Pica's makeup is always smoky eye, faded out, super soft, except for when they put makeup on um, Kristen Stewart or Kirsten Stewart. I, was, I never know her name. Like, they always mess her up. She always looks dreadful. But that's because that girl is so beautiful without makeup. The second you put makeup on her, bleach her hair, she looks like a monster. Let her grow her hair naturally long, no makeup needed, she's just so beautiful. And the second Chanel does anything to uh, Stewart, makes her look like shite. Sorry, girl, but it's true. You, it's, you're, you're not made for Chanel. You should be wearing something. You should be wearing Calvin Klein jeans on a beach somewhere and you're gonna look amazing. You should not be wearing Chanel. But that's just my five cents. But Lucia Pica, minus the mistakes made casting-wise, by other people, uh, Lucia Pica also delivers that soft blow. You see what I'm getting at? Finally, this, and this smell of this perfume made everything fall into place for me and made me say, okay, this is the new era of Chanel. It is official. This perfume officializes it. You might like it or not like it, doesn't matter. From a historical point of view, this perfume delivers exactly that point in time and space when we can say officially It's official. <laughs> Jacob's seal of approval, it's official. The new era of Chanel is here and there's no going back. But paradoxically, this is going back. It feels as if we're back when Coco was alive and in her 20s, developing all of these concepts. So it's a beautiful time uh, to be a part of uh, the Chanel fandom. Again, my humble opinion. Call me biased, but I am very analytical in these things. You know, I'm gonna be critical if there's something critical to say. Now, having said that, keep that in mind, let's get to the actual smell. I have smelled this before. Okay, Th this is a type of smell that in the 2000s somewhere, and I haven't been able to pinpoint what exactly it is. some Comme des Garçons perfume or something that Woodward could have done in collaboration with some perfumers. It has that niche type of early 2000s. Back then there was no such thing as hype beast, but it was kind of considered the, the hype beast of the early noughties. That's the smell of this. So it doesn't really smell of the 20s today. It's a smell that's a bit rooted in the early 2000s. In fact, it has a similar character to Olivier Polge's early 2000s Dior Homme Original. 
they're different perfumes. Don't make the mistake now to think uh, that Jacob is saying that these smell similar. They don't. Okay, they have. They don't smell sim. They do. They do not smell similar, but you can smell that the same person made them. And it feels to me as if Olivier is trying to kind of go back to his golden era when he was doing his best work. And his best work is this, Dior Homme, the original. Oh my God. Oh my God. Majestical. Majestic. Majestical child. This reminds me of this. Less edgy. You know, this is more, even more soft. But them two together. Magic. The chemistry between these two, they're like, they're lovers. They see each other and copulation, babies, love affair for the rest of their life. They just work very well. You can even layer them very well. But it is an Olivier Polge that tried to turn his golden era into Chanel. So he toned it down for Chanel because he knows he has to be more austere for Chanel, but still he rounds around the edges. So we have that softness in here, still maintaining the legacy of the Lezouz, but with that early 2000s vibe in mind. And another thing, and now we're going to go on this trip together. What does this smell of? Heat. I might be biased because I'm trying it now in the middle of summer and it's super hot, actually. Let me get the fan out again. Um, I'm in a tropical climate right now, so... But the second I smelled this, I smelled a forest after the rain. Pine needles all around me. Cypress, this thing has cypress, juniper berries, but mostly it is a very specific type of smell of forest after the rain, which we know the smell post rain is called petrichor. What a beautiful word. Bizarre word. Petrichor. Petrichor, the smell after the rain. So I've done some research because I know that depending on where I am and which part of the world, if we're after a dry, so this is a very specific version of petrichor because yes, there are different types. So imagine walking through this forest, but before we go to, back to this forest, in my life I have smelled dry spells and then after rain pours, after it's been dry for a long time, depending on where you are in the city, it's going to smell different than in a forest, than on the beach. There's different smells depending where you are. Put a pin in that. But we're talking about a specific type of petrichor that you get in the summer in a forest, pine needle forest, after a long dry spell, the first rain. And this, so I started doing my research. I was like, well, does petrichor smell different depending on where you are in the world? And yes, it does. Research has brought me to a very, very interesting um, conclusion or surprise discovery for me. A lot of you probably know it, but for me it was, okay, so listen, first, let's get to the root of petrichor. Um, so petrichor, on a hot, summery, dry day is the smell after a sudden rainfall. So heat, rain passed, and the soil is dry again because the clouds dissipated and the sun dried all humidity. Okay, so listen, this is my explaining the whole thing. Wait, hold on. Petrichor comes, stems from ancient Greek. So we got Two words, Petros and Ikor. Petros or Petra, male or female in Greek, so it could come, it could stem from Petra or Petros. Petra is rock. Petros is stone. And Ikor or Ikor. And now Ikor is a very interesting word. The Greek root means the fluid that flows in the veins of the gods. How interesting to call this smell petrichor when you're mixing 
a rock and a stone, which is, the, for human beings, it's the symbology of solid matter, the opposite of liquid and fluid, you combine that with ikor or ikor, which is the fluid that flows in the veins of the gods. Petrichor. Now, what is the fluid that blow, blow, flows in the veins of the gods? Now, since this has a specific scent, petrichor, I immediately associate, well, of course, the fluid that flows in the veins of the gods is perfume. And this is why, you know, I always say perfume is a key that unlocks memories and makes you fly to places you never thought you were before. It's a godly liquid. It's heavenly fluid perfumes. Not saying that this particular perfume is that good. We're going to get to the quality of it later. I'm just saying. Petrichor. What a wonderful word. What a wonderful combination of symbologies in connection to smell. Because petrichor is a smell. So it is about scent. It is about perfume, after all. So, all right. Now I'm going to fix this stupid hair. And I'm going to tell you. Petrichor, a term coined in 1964 by the Australian scientists to describe the unique earthy smell associated with rain. It is caused by water from the rain, along with certain compounds like ozone, geosin, and plant oils. So I was like, geosin. Well, let's research more about what that could be, because remember, I said it's this one... Reminds me of the smell of the forest after the rain. Pine needle forest. I was like, what is geosin, huh? Well, geosin is a chemical found in certain bacterias. All right. Now, let's get to these bacterias because I'm like, oh, so this is an organic thing. It is organic. It is an organic thing, the ends. I just swallow my ends. So bacteria, when the soil dries out, talking about the forest, bacteria produce spores in the soil. Because these bacteria, we're going to get to the name of the bacteria, they thrive in humidity and wet soils. But then after a longer dry spell, they, they die. They produce these spores as they pass away. And these spores are in the soil. But then when it starts raining, the heft of the rain, because it's heavy, it keeps kind of pounding on the soil and the wetness of it, it creates this dust. It kind of pushes everything from the soil upwards. The, and these spores, okay, these spores just get pushed up into the air and we inhale them. Scary, isn't it? Isn't it? We're inhaling spores of bacteria. These spores, which are made of the on a base of geosin, or, or geosin, or however you want to pronounce it. And this uh, geosin, or geosin, is an alcohol, which is basically the main compound of every freaking perfume. So these bacteria are not harmful to us, so don't worry, you're not getting weirdly poisoned or inhabited by bacteria while inhaling their spores walking through the forest. But the geosin alcohol contained within the spores of these dead bacterias has a sweetly smell, has a very pleasant sweet smell, mixed, of course, with the oils in the air. I mean, a lot of things mixed together. But why do we always have the same smell of petrichor? All across the world because this bacteria that is called actinomycetes or actinomycetes or actinomycetes depending on which country you're in how you want to pronounce it it's actinomycetes or actinomycetes or actinomycetes they are one of the most spread out and common bacterias all across the world that's why that same smell and this is so beautiful it, it just shows it unites us all no matter if you're in the rainforest in Brazil, if you are in China, if you are in Europe, if you're in America, if you're in Australia, chances are you're going to smell the same type 
of petrichor smell while walking through the forest after a dry spell and after a rain. Because it's the same, it's the same little tiny bacteria uh, that are spread out worldwide. That's why the smell is similar. So the spores have a distinctive smell. It's an earthy smell that we often associate with rainfall. The moist air easily carries these spores to us, so we breathe them in. These spores have a distinctive earthy smell, and um, one of the most pleasant rain smells is the one we notice in the woods after the rain has fallen. Now, we have other types of smells after the rain in the city, all over the, the world, it's, it's all different. But in the rain, in the, in the forest, it's a very specific smell. So, and in particular, Edinburgh reminds me of that rain that has fallen after a dry spell in the forest. It's not that fresh, though. This smell smells like, okay, the rain has fallen. Petrichor smell is there, but the clouds are gone. And the sun has started shining again, and it's starting to dry out whatever was wet on the soil. So there is this, envision this sense of petrichor as it's dying out. And it's also a very specific smell that has never been defined before, and I want to define it here with you guys. And it is, because at this point, it's obvious what I'm hinting at, right? I'm hinting at petrichor being a perfume on its own. And if Petrichor were a perfume in its own, it would have top note, mid note, and bass note. Edinburgh, in particular, reminds me of Petrichor in the bass notes. When Petrichor is about to fade out completely, because the rain has fallen, as I said, and then the sun has come out again, and it's starting to dry out all what is wet and humid, and it's just about to all be dried out again. But right before it gets all dried out, we have that last whiff of, of that sweetly petrichor smell, but it's not just that wet anymore. There's this pressure kicking in as well. You feel the pressure from the that humidity that's kind of pumping up and it's like the last bits of humidity are getting absorbed by the sun and evaporated. So you, got, you have that heat pushing you on your head from the sunbeams, but at the same time, you have that last oomph of humidity kind of pushing upwards and you feel a little bit squished. It's a specific feeling that you get in the forest when that happens. And that, that has a smell too. That last whiff of petrichor, when things get even more soily and you start smelling the heat within that smell, because before it was just a humid smell, but now there's heat added into the, this condensation. And that's what uh, Edinburgh smells of. Um, what else did I write here? A new smell that resembles simpler constructions, said that, more rounded, less sharp at the end, said that too. Those are the characters of Olivier's perfumes for Chanel, and that is the style of Yaz's clothing designs for Chanel. Less edgy, softer, more simple, and in a way, effortless, and closer to Coco's own vision of her clothes and style. It's almost like we needed over 30 years of always over-the-top styling by Lagerfeld to be able to afford being allowed to be simple and the simplicity of something that I don't even know what I wrote here, of a truer Chanel today. Oh, a truer Chanel. So, Lagerfeld salvaged a sinking ship, and now the ship is finally back on route to Coco's Vision Island. And this is the ending note for this review. In vision, we have gone through this forest, we have smelled the petrichor, now it's all over us, we have the smell of Edinburgh all over us, and we reach a shore, and there's a ship waiting on that shore, and we, we um, bark on that ship, embark the ship, and the ship guides us to a specific place, a place where Coco Chanel is still alive, still thriving and living, and it is a place where it's an island and it is a perfume. Guess which one? Bois des Îles. 
So now we're going to the island forests, or the forests of the islands, which is the name of the perfume in French, translated into English. And that's where we, of course, Bois des Îles is all about the sandalwood, not present here. But because it's not present here, it's almost echoed in the type of formulation that Olivier delivers for Paris Edinburgh. You see that he combined his early 2000s way of seeing perfumes, and then he was thinking about Bois des Îles, because there's a lot of that softness that Bois des Îles also delivers in the bass notes is also present in Edinburgh, even though Edinburgh is not Bois des Îles. Far from it. But it delivers an understanding of Bois It delivers a nostalgia and a poetry that also Bois delivers. And so we are embarking, after we went through the Petrichor Forest, we are embarking... Petrichor Forest, that sounds good as a name for a perfume too. We're embarking on that ship that is taking us to the place where Coco is still alive, and that is on a special island where we have Bois des Îles. And Bois des Îles reuniting, or uniting, with uh, Paris Edinburgh, uh, or Edinburgh, uh, is, is very magical. I'm not saying that they really fit well together, but just the idea of Olivier Pauge creating a 2021 version of Bois des Îles. That is poetic in itself. And that's exactly what Paris Edinburgh is. It is a new forest of the islands. It is a brand new concept of what we already know from Chanel, which is Bois des Îles. And again, we're back to the 20s, because Bois des Îles was released in the 20s. And again, we're back to the con 1920s. And we're back to the concept of, of this lightness, of, of being... Coco Chanel being still alive, but just reinterpreted and re-envisioned re for the 2020s. So Paris Edinburgh is also a new take, a new spin on Bois des Îles, which we already have uh, had in the past. In the 90s, so we've got 90, 30 years ago, you could say by now, uh, Egoiste was released. And Egoiste is also a take. Egoiste was Jacques Polge's take on Bois des Îles. Paris Edinburgh is Olivier Polge's take on Bois des Îles. After all, we are in the 20s and again, 100 years, you know, almost, because Bois des Îles was not released in 1921, it was released a bit later, but still, you get, you get the gist. Um, this is definitely Olivier Polge's own Bois des Îles. And it's on a different island, obviously, because I said, as I said, this one is in that Petrichor forest. Once we walk through it, we embark a ship to go to Bois des Îles, to go to that other island where Chanel is at. They're two separate islands, but Olivier has created his own island. Olivier has created his own version of that forest islands, an illusion of rain falling on a dry spell. That island that has been dry for so long Olivier is like, I'm going to let the rain fall on it. I'm going to deliver new, fresh air. We're going to have that petrichor, uh, foresty petrichor. And we're going to, after that, comes new fruits, new plants, new life. He's literally trying poetically through this perfume to breathe in fresh new air into Chanel perfumes. The perfume is different for Chanel. It is fresh new air for Chanel perfumes. But, here's the but, it's not a perfume that you crave all the time. You have to learn to get used to it. It has very poor uh, longevity. Lasts one to two hours tops on the skin. Very, very poor projection. Silage. <laughs> I always cry when I say silage. <laughs> like, oh my God, so vulgar. Pronounce it in a French way. Uh, it's very, it stays close to the skin, very toned down, very muted. What you do get a lot of as it starts drying down is cedar and vetiver. A lot of cedar and vetiver. Um, 
you know, I wish it had, I, I wish it maintained more vanilla in the dry down that it stayed sweeter because it does tend to dissipate, that sweetness tends to kind of dissipate and you're left with a lot of cedar. So if you're a fan of cedar, this is the one for you. I'm not a big fan of cedar. So if a perfume ends up being all about cedar, I'm like, hmm. Thank you, next. Still, there's poetry to this. I understand what he was going for making it. Uh, and there's a honey note in here as well. It's the vanilla mixed with the cypress, I guess. It creates this. But I really got to warm it up to, to make it smell sweet again. I really crave the vanilla in this one. You know, I want it to be sweeter. I, and I know I'm not usually a fan of sweet perfume. I'm not talking about sweet chulis and all that stuff. I'm just talking about, like, you know, don't let the cedar take completely over. Try to get the cedar to be a little bit less toned, a little bit more toned down. Because we know cedar is a plant is a tree and is a smell that you can get in in every shampoo if you want shower gel deodorants like it's cedar is one of those smells that is also very easily synthetically replicated and it's it's an annoying smell to me uh it's very rare to get i love cedar wood trunks made out of ancient cedar that's a totally different story right but the cedar that you can buy today easily in every drugstore it, it's it's it ain't it i'm not saying this is cheap cedar it's not, obviously, but I always want to bypass it with my nose. So I always want to warm up because if, if I just let it dry out, it's just going to be that annoying cedar that I don't like. But if I kind of warm it up by blowing onto my skin and kind of popping the molecules, then I get the, um, then I get the vanilla and I get the sweetness and I get uh, juniper berry all over. But the juniper berry... It's okay, you know. My favorite uh, juniper uh, perfume is uh, Voyage d'Hermes. That, sm that smells like a gin, gin tonic. A lot of people say, oh, there's yeah juniper berries in here. It smells like gin. It doesn't smell like gin to me. It's um, There's so many other things in here to make it smell like... If you want to say this smells like gin, then it's a gin that has been enriched with a lot of other ingredients. But Voyage d'Hermes is just like pure gin tonic. Uh, this one... There's more nuance. It's not, it's not that simple. But yeah, it needs more vanilla and you got to tone down the cedar. And I think if they're going to reformulate it, you know, in the future, maybe think about that balance a bit more and uh, then, then it's perfect. Then it's perfect. So, um, do not blind purchase this one. Smell it first, test it out several days because it does have a tendency of changing its mood on you. And then, you know, figure out if you really want one or not. Thank you so much for watching my review of Paris Edinburgh by Chanel from the Lazoo range. Let me read your comments. Jesus says, gin smells really nice. Rich Mitch says, favorite juniper perfume is Lauder for men. From Estee Lauder? You need Lauder for men in your life. Lori says, I did layer it with vanilla. It softened a bit. Yeah. Yeah, you need to layer it with vanilla. Hold on. Um, oh, you need to... It's the cedar for me. Uh, oh, hey, Laura, the CC Spy. I tried it the other day and liked it, but you have now taken it to another level for me. Oh, good. <laughs> Thanks. I'm glad I did. Aisha says, no one reviews perfume like you do, Dago. Thank you so much, Aisha. Jesus says, Egoist is a more aggressive take on Bois des Îles. Okay, guys, let me just open a little parenthesis here. Um, Egoist is only a more aggressive take on Bois des Îles for two reasons. One, because the Vandheimer family or one of the Vandheimers came to um, Jacques Polge and said, I really love Bois des Îles, but it is marketed to women. Can you make a male version of it? So Jacques had to make it a bit more, that what you perceive as more aggressive is because uh, they added more woodsy notes to it. Not necessarily sandal. Just made it more spicy. But truth be told, Egoist is the mass marketed version, which is more aggressive and synthetic than the original idea 
that Vadheim had when he came to Jacques Poche to say, hey, make a version for me of Bois des Îles. Jacques made Bois Noir for the Vertheimers. And Bois Noir, Chanel perfume, Bois Noir was released in the late 80s only in Chanel boutiques for a very short period of time. More complex perfume to make, more expensive, um, more noble ingredients were used. And then it was taken off the market soon after that because it performed well. And Chanel decided to release it as a main release, tone it down, produce it a bit cheaper for the mass market. And that's how Egoist was born. So Egoist was first Bois des Îles. Bois des Îles then became Bois Noir, the Black Forest, because it had more aggressive aspects to it, but it was still much softer than Egoist, because Egoist was a mass release product, while Bois Noir was released in such a small quantity with really good ingredients. So it's really hard to find Bois Noir these days, and if you do, it costs a, a leg and a kidney. But uh, truth be told, Bois Noir, the predecessor of Egoist, was not as aggressive as Egoist. And the only reason why Egoist is so aggressive is because it's much more synthetic. Parenthesis closed. Lord Chalfie says, Petrichor by Super Jacob. Let's go outdoors. Loving it. Begging for it. Oh my God. Jesus says, Bacteria de Chanel. And Mina O says, there is something magical about the smaller about the smell after the rain. Guerlain, uh, Guerlain's après l'onde, lond, uh, smell, oh God, after, oh, you know what I mean. Smells like a garden after rainfall. I'm intrigued uh, with uh, Paris, Edinburgh. Can't wait to, to try it. I mean, I'm interested what you're going to think about it. Yeah. There's a business opportunity for you, Jacobs, says Lord Charfield in the Petrichor. You can't put a price tag on fabulosity. This is Mr. Philip Fabulous. Oh, and science has entered the bunker. Thanks, Jacob, says Mike Yota. You're welcome, sweetie. Very, very interesting, says Jesus. Oh, Debbie, yeah, maybe you're allergic to that bacteria because you're having allergies after the rain and stuff. But uh, if it's a dry spell, you don't inhale those. But you're, usually, you're probably in springtime, you're getting allergies from all the pollens in the air, which is a totally different topic altogether. Um, Pedro says, Jacob, do you know Eau de Soir? It's beautiful about rain. The smell is actually that released from bacteria in the soil. As rain falls, the smell arises. I think you posted that comment before I explained it, maybe? Mr. Philip, I've said it before and I'll say it again. I want the blood drained out of my dead body and replaced with Chanel Number no. 5 perfume and you become one of the gods. Jack Dean says, this description is giving me life. Jack says, love Petrichor, the word and the smell. I love this. Uh, the word is amazing. The word is just a brilliant genius. Whoever came up with it, from Australia, from down under, what did I say it was? 1964. Um, Chanel are going uh, goth with Kristen. Well, they're trying to, Mr. Phil, but she's not goth. She's just dressed in Chanel with that makeup. It's a joke. That's not, sorry. That's not punk. That's not goth. That's just, that's just no. <laughs> but anyway, I can, I can cue in the credits so we can end it here as well uh rich mitch says might buy but rich mitch i recommend you to definitely um try it out first but don't blind purchase it you know because it ain't cheap um herbal yeah and because of that camphorous eucalyptus type of smell in there it's medicinal as well it has a hint of medicinal herbal in there as well you know uh, yes, Aisha, there's something powdery in there somewhere. It's, um, what did I call it? A um, slight smoky resinous smell. I think it's the smoke with the resins that smells powdery in a way. Steven Tino says, yes, nice but overpriced. For one euro mil, you can get so many amazing fragrances. It's more than one euro per mil because the price went up. So... 
and and it has very very weak lasting power you guys thank you so much for watching if you haven't already subscribed to my channel now is the 10 thumb up this video you can also join me on um, become a member today of the fashion bunker gain access to extra perks you can also join me on patreon gain access to extra perks some of the many many perks you get is also to be listed at the end of every video in the uh, scrolling credit roll uh, as the co-producer of the fashion bunker so also follow me on my um, totally, uh, not totally, essentially Jacob perfume dedicated YouTube channel. And you can also follow me on my Chanel dedicated Instagram profiles. Coco Chanel is in my house, all spelled together, dedicated to my Chanel collection and everything the brand is up to these days. And the other uh, profile is called Coco Chanel Privé, all spelled together, dedicated to the life of Coco Chanel. I mean, you guys, social media, it just keeps growing and growing and growing. What can I tell you? Uh, I love you so much for watching. Thank you so much. Until next time, never forget to never give up on love. Love you all. See you soon. Take care. Bye.